the best in the world podcast with Richard Parr. Hello and welcome to the best in the world with Richard Parr. This week's guest is the Olympic swimming gold medalist Tom Shields. Tom went to his first Olympic Games this summer in Rio de Janeiro and was part of the team which won the 4x100 meters medley relay at the Games in the pool. Tom was part of the heats and part of the team which won the gold medal. He talks about that and his disappointment in his individual races in this week's podcast. One of the nicest people I think I've interviewed on this show. We talk a range of topics, not only from what makes him a great champion, such as his daily routine, his nutrition, what he does in the gym, all of that stuff, as, as well as meditation. But we also talk about things such as religious studies, what books he reads, what podcasts he recommends. It's really a good insight into the life of a swimming world and Olympic champion. So it's a really nice listen with Tom Shields. He'll give details of how you can follow him on Twitter, Instagram, etc. in the show. I recommend you go and do that. We've also got details in the description page. Just before we get to Tom, I want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by Sportachino. Sportachino is a brand new sports breakfast show on Facebook Live. To be able to watch the show, all you've got to do is like the page facebook.com forward slash Sportachino. If you don't know how to spell it, it's S-P-O-R-T-U-C-C-I-N-O. It's a brand new show. It's hosted by me, Richard Parr, of course, and they are this week's sponsor on The Best in the World. Please go and check them out. All right, let's get to it. Let's get to my interview with the Olympic swimming champion, Tom Shields. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. Tom Shields, Olympic swimming champion. Welcome to The Best in the World. We'll begin with the very beginning, I think. Um, How did you first get interested in competitive swimming? Oh, man. Well, thanks for having me on the show, first of all. Um... So I started swimming when I was around six or seven. I learned how to swim. Um, And then I grew up in a beach community. So like being pool safe wasn't necessarily um, safe enough. Um, So I started swimming club with a bunch of my other friends to kind of become uh, water safe so we could swim in the ocean by ourselves, which was a big draw for us. And um, the talent kind of stood out there very early on. So I was like, and it's fun to win. So I just kind of kept doing it. (laughs) Were you always competitive? Are you competitive in everything you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hyper competitive, and although I'm not very good at many things, but I can swim, so <laughs> that's what I like to do. Well, uh, in fact, I read something about you by one of your teammates saying that you're not just competitive when it comes to actual racing. You're even competitive in practicing. You're just one of these people who just really hates losing. Um, yeah, you know, I think that's something as I've grown older, I've tried to get away from because it can create a lot of negative emotions. But yeah, I mean, I hate, (laughs) I hate being frustrated. Um, you know, I I always like to tell myself it's more of like, I like winning. And then, you know, when you lose, you kind of deal with it because it's a little bit more emotionally healthy. But yeah, I'm not gonna lie. It's not the most fun thing I've ever done. (laughs) <laughs> was there an age as you were growing up where you realized that this is where you want to focus all of your attention and like was there an age where you went i want to reach the olympic games for example yeah i think it was later for me i think it was around 20 21 hmm. maybe even 22 when i was really like okay this is one thing that i want to do I, I, i'm the kind of guy who's I'm not going to, I can't focus 12 years out. I'm not going to focus three. I mean, right now I'm looking at 2020, but you know, really I'm looking at worlds in December and I'm really good at committing to the short term and just building on that. So when I was in middle school, I really wanted to do well in high school and at, um, you know, sectional championships when I was in middle school, when I was in high school, I really wanted to do well at um, our state meet and, uh, get recruited for college. And then when I was in college, I wanted really wanted to do well at NCAA level. And then in 2012, I was in college when we went to Olympic trials. And then I really kind of saw what that meet was. And I was like, oh, okay, like 
not only am I good enough to be on the stage, which I didn't know I was beforehand, but this is something that I kind of want to do. And then I finished up my college career and my coach convinced me to stick around. And, uh, you know, it's been a really rewarding experience and I've learned a lot and grown as a person. But more than that, I feel like I've done a pretty good job of doing the job. Mm. Um, and I've learned a lot of things, you know, now that I've been to the Olympics, I really feel like, okay, now this is something I really, um, think I can do again and a lot better, you know, and I have four years to kind of learn more and grow more and, and, uh, you know, do more. So I'm super stoked to get to stick around and that's kind of where I'm at now. But yeah, I don't really think of it like as a, I wasn't the kid who was like 10, like, oh yeah, like this is what I want to do. Mm. Is, is that part of the... The area you've grown up in, because obviously, you know, by the beach, you very often get quite a laid back culture, especially in, in California. Is, is that something where you think kind of the environment has, has given you that kind of attitude? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, I'm no sociological expert, but I mean, that's <laughs> probably a part of it. There, there was plenty of distractions, especially in the summers. So, yeah. And uh, being a short course uh, prominent athlete, which for us in the States is mostly a winter thing and then the summers being long course where I felt like I didn't have the talent or the uh skill I mean it's potentially just because I was so just doing other things <laughs> at that time period you know mm-hmm. so who knows and you, you mentioned college you studied religious studies where did that interest come I from did. um so I you know I grew up um you know going to church three to four times a week um, whether that be through uh a service night where you reach out in the community or, uh, the high school had its own high school group had its own Sunday service. And then we had the high school youth group, um, at some point in the midweek. And then we had church Sunday morning. So it was like a really like sticky group and really like high commitment. And, uh, I kind of thought I was going to be a pastor. And, um, then I came to Cal where, you know, divinity isn't really what is offered at Cal. Um, obviously. So I studied religious studies and I feel like I learned a lot by studying religion through a different, um, scope, a lot more of a critical scope. And, you know, like I did get to read Marx and Durkheim and, uh, Max Weber and, you know, plenty of others, uh, you know, Clifford Geertz and, and Taves and Reza Aslan, you know, like all these great minds that just think differently than I was brought up about religion. So it was really cool to study. And, um, you know, I kind of got my first taste and I was like, Oh, I want more. Um, it wasn't what I expected at all. And now I feel like I have, you know, a greater appreciation. And, you know, I don't know if, um, you know, serving as a pastor is for me anymore. I don't think I ever really had that skill set to begin with. Um, but I've, you know, I just wanted to learn things and that's why I majored in what I majored in. And, um, if you have that opportunity, obviously I highly recommend that, but, uh, obviously I, I get majoring in something that pays. Mm. But uh, fortunately, I was afforded or uh, uh, it worked out that I didn't do that. Um, You know, I didn't know I was going to go pro the whole time. But um, these first eight years out of college, fortunately, I've had a job. So um, it worked out for me. It doesn't work out for everybody, obviously. Mm, Fantastic. With all of that studying in the religious studies, were there many things you may have picked up from that which you were able to implement into your swimming at all? Um, you know, if anything, I think it just really like gave me, uh, a continued growth into something else where it's like been really hard for me to just swim and there'd be seasons or periods of my life where all I'm doing is swimming and I'm not, um, being like a whole person, which is not good. (laughs) And so I think for me, it just kind of gives me that avenue to, um, it gave me that avenue in college and now. I think it's just like interesting to me. So I'll, uh, you know, read old texts or try to pretend I know how to read ancient Greek (laughs) still (laughs) and stuff like that just to kind of keep, not keep busy, but like keep engaged with my life. Right. Mm. And with the religious studies, uh, obviously you were also training to be a swimmer and competing. How good were you at juggling both studying and training? Not. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, you got to learn like what the priorities are. And my last, like I started uh, college in the fall of 2009. So I, you know, according to the typical American plan, I should have graduated in May or June of uh, 2013. And I graduated in late June of 2015. 
Um, but I kind of got to the point where swimming was uh, paying my bills and uh, school wasn't. So I kind of had to shift focus and really make sure that uh, swimming was going well. And, um, you know, really the last year and a half of my college career um, at, athletically at Cal, so 2012 and 2013, it really shifted focus to make sure that I could uh, go pro. And then once I went pro, uh, it, that focus kind of maintained until I could take a step back and take a few classes and get done. Um, and, you know, I think I balanced that well, considering, you know, I got my degree in, in time and um, I got to have this as a job. And that doesn't happen for a lot of people. Um, you know, either one will happen or the other or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I think it went great. You know, I didn't have the best grades, but I didn't have the worst either. So, um, you know, like looking back at it, it worked out. I don't I feel like I could have done better. But I definitely could have done a lot worse too. Mm. And you know, if to become a pastor, you you need to kind of be an inspiring person. You need to kind of inspire others. And one of the things that I've read about you is that you're quite inspiring to your teammates. You're quite positive. You try and pump everyone up. Uh, what kind of things do you do to 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 keep the morale high? Because obviously, you you won gold in in relay, so there's some yeah, success yeah. to it. Well, yeah, I mean, the Olympics is weird because I was a, you know, absolutely not weird. The Olympics is what it is. And I was a rookie. So I was really just kind of like listening and trying to learn um, as much as I can from the wealth of experience that's there. Um, and then, you know, when I work out with the guys, like, you know, I'm a lot probably the oldest guy in the water when Nathan's not there. And, um, you know, and he'll be in the sprint group. So, like, yeah, I definitely feel like um, the grandpa of the group. But that being said, like you got to know when people will be receptive to help and when they're not. And, uh, you know, a lot of people come, a lot of guys come in, um, you know, eyes wide open and want to soak up all they can, or, you know, guys come in and they know exactly what they want out of it. And so you're going to have to adapt to that. Uh, you know, obviously I, I love it. I think, um, I love being around a team environment. I love developing and working with guys. I feel like, you know, uh, working with young guys and kind of teaching them to master the basic basics, uh, keeps me on my game and I also learn things from them as time goes on and it's cool to you know year by year at Cal get the opportunity to get fresh people through and people who have that excitement every fall which is something that you wouldn't necessarily have if you weren't out of college so you know definitely it's a it's a symbiotic environment and I definitely appreciate that. Mm. What is your pre-race ritual? Because we saw those great pictures at the Olympics where you got Chad Leclerc dancing around and you got Michael Phelps yeah, just uh, staring at a black hole. What do you do before a big race? Um, I just try and keep a low profile and I don't try to worry too much about um, that kind of stuff. You know, I listen to music, I stretch out, um, just try to make sure I'm ready. I think Moving forward, the lessons that I learned at the Olympics is uh, I need to focus a lot more on like clearing my head, and I'm trying to learn how to do that now, um, you know, through different breathing techniques or meditation. And um, I'm definitely going to take that to the blocks. But I think I've had a lack of a solid plan, like 30 seconds before the race or five to 10 minutes before. Um, so that's something that I'm learning now, you know, and I feel like that's cool to to get to grow through that process. Was there anyone in particular who was really advocating the benefits of meditation to you during the Olympics? Um, not necessarily at the games. You know, once you're there, you're very much in what you've been doing and you don't want to make any changes. And that's kind of the message that we received. And I think that's the best advice. Um, and now coming off of it, it's like, okay, what went well? What went wrong? Where was I weak? What could I, what could I get better at? And, um, you know, individual, my individual races weren't there at all at the Olympics, which is unfortunate. But, um, you know, I, I haven't watched them because, you know, obviously it's been hard uh, to kind of deal with that. Because it's like, oh, man, this is the biggest meet of my life. And I didn't perform anywhere near my level, um, let alone at a competitive level, even though I didn't make a final. Um, so I'm trying to learn everything I can about approaching it correctly outside of the water first because i think there's a lot of things that went wrong just in between my ears and then maybe athletically a couple days up and just trying to think about that now and then when i can uh, get some emotional healthy time i'll sit down and watch the race and be like okay this is what can go better there so it's just been a, a slow process of coming back to figuring it out you know but i've just kind of given myself that time to um because i have it you know this is mm -hmm. the one time i'm going to have that time in the next four years so I took it. 
Oh, no, no, fantastic. How was, you mentioned your, your disappointment in the, um, in your individual races, and obviously we'll talk a bit more about your, your success in the relays, but overall, what, what was your feeling towards the experience of being at the Olympics? Obviously you've got the opening ceremony, being around the village, being around all of the, all the different, um, athletes. How did you find all of that? Um, it was awesome. You know, like I made the Olympic team with, uh, five other teammates from Cal and we got to stay in the same suite, um, together in the dorms. And, uh, you know, it's a really long experience, uh, compared to other, uh, world level meets that we go to, um, being like a month and a half versus just a couple of weeks. So just like enjoying that time together with those guys and, uh, kind of feeling like a college kid again. And the fact that you're always around the team and, um, you know, that my wife's not there. It's not, um, you know, it's not the way it is now. And so it was just kind of like a nice step back into that environment. Um, you know, and, that, and that's going to be the stuff that I remember more than anything else is just the time spent with the people. The best in the world podcast with Richard Parr. More from Tom in just a moment, but I want to tell you that as well as Sportachino, this week's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Audible is one of the leading suppliers of audiobooks in the world. They've got over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. They've got lots of different books in all different types of genre. Obviously, you like sport because you're listening to the best in the world with Richard Barr. There's a lot to choose from there. Check it out. And... They're offering you a free 30-day trial to check out their service. All you've got to do is go to audibletrial.com forward slash best. That's audibletrial.com forward slash best. That includes one free download so you can get listening straight away to an audiobook in your ears. What a way to start the day with an audiobook with Audible. That code one more time, audibletrial.com forward slash best thanks a lot to them for supporting the show all right coming up more from tom shields the best in the world podcast with richard parr so you you mentioned that there are things that you can learn from uh the Olympics you've just competed in at the 2016 games and that you'll be able to build on when you compete at the next one in 2020. But mm-hmm. obviously you won gold at the world championships in Kazan in the four by 100 meters. And then you won mm-hmm. gold in the same event at the Olympic games. How mm-hmm. much did that success at the world champions help prepare you and propel you for the Rio games? Um, a lot, you know, and I, and I don't think it really panned out as far as, as real. The things that I learned, I wasn't necessarily good at implementing, um, from worlds, but, um, I don't know. There's no positive spin on that. That was a bummer, (laughs) but you know, I got to be on the relay. I got to be surrounded by my teammates and I got to feel that environment. And, uh, you know, I was just on the prelims and, uh, Michael took over at night. Um, you know, rightfully so he's the best butterfly ever. And, uh, it was just cool to watch him in that last relay and watch him swim with, uh, two of the guys that I trained with. And, um, I got to swim in prelims with, you know, three guys that I've known, uh, for, uh, quite a long time. And, um, you know, and I just, I just, I think the thing that I learned from worlds is to cherish that, you know, is, uh, at worlds, I kind of got wrapped up in, uh, the time and the performance and the pressure. Like we have to win this relay because it's the foreigner medley. And, um, you know, while that's valuable to remember, uh, while I'm training, you know, is that, that, you know, we have that pride in that event. But um, in the moment, I think I would have done better to enjoy that experience more at Worlds. And um, this year at the Olympics, I think I did an okay job of doing that um, through that experience. Mm. And you've had great success in the short course and you're going to have great mm-hmm. success in the long course. For those who don't necessarily know about swimming, what are the fundamental differences between success at those different disciplines? I don't know, man. Um <laughs> The way that my coach says, it's like, look, a fast swimmer is a fast swimmer and everything else is just what you tell yourself. Um, and that's kind of the perspective that I have moving forward. Uh, I, you know, I've had the exact level of success that I would have thought that I could have. Um, so I think now it's just learning to think that I can have more success or learning to think um, that I can go faster. 
uh, whether it be short course or long course. But, you know, then there's the technical side of things. Like short course obviously favors turns, component work, skills, and underwaters, whereas long course favors not dying or longer strokes or what have you or more rhythmic swimming. Um, but that being said, like, man, if you're good, you're good. And mm -hmm. that's just the fact. Yeah, and obviously now you've got time to unwind. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But building up to the Olympics, you're probably going through the most rigorous training of, of your whole career. Maybe just give mm. us an, an insight into what a typical day would seem like for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think on a typical double, which is like, I guess, the gnarlier day, um, we're in the water at 6 a.m. We'll get out at 8, and then I usually go home, like roll out and stretch and eat breakfast. I'll take a little nap for like an hour or two. I'll hit the weight room around 12.30, uh, lift for an hour and a half, grab a quick stretch, get in the pool, uh, swim for about another hour or two, um, mostly like power type stuff, and then um, kind of rest and recover off of that at night. And then uh, usually the day after that will be a single um, in the morning or in the afternoon, um, in a longer swim, and then we'll do another double, and then, you know, the pattern continues. So what exactly are you doing in the gym? Is it low reps with heavy weights, or is it lots of reps with light weights? What, what type of things are you doing in the gym? Oh, man, that is, that's not my job. We do a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of follow directions there. I'm trying to take a little bit more ownership of that, but the weight stuff is hard to know is very like scientific obviously but uh, i've worked with great coaches and um you know i think the most important thing is that we change it up about every three weeks so you know it depends on the time of year it depends on what we need it depends on the direction that i'm headed and then we'll adapt based on what's happening in my body right mm -hmm. that's i think that's the biggest ideal um but yeah man a lot of olympic lifting a lot of power stuff a lot of um, agility stuff and you know what you would think you would do for swimming. Mm. Do you enjoy it or do you just wish you were in the pool? Um, I've gone both ways. I think as I get older, I enjoy it more because you can see rapid um, movement forward in the weight room mm. um, compared to other parts of the sport. It's less frustrating. Um, but then there'll be other times where it's like, yeah, I feel like this is taken away from me swimming fast in the pool at this time of year. But um, I'm also learning that that's, not, I just, that's just me overtraining. So that was my fault. And um, this year I'm kind of excited to not have that happen. Mm, that, that can be a danger. What, was, what would be typically in your diet on, on one of these training days? What, what are the type of foods that you'd be eating normally? Um, so I work with uh, Renaissance Periodization. Um, it's a nutrition company. I work with a guy named Mike Goddard, and he's kind of taught me, um, you know, you don't have any more than five ounces of meat at any given time. Um, kind of times out my carbs I have sometimes I'll have there'll be times a day like during practice I'll have you know super high uh glycemic index carbs and then there'll be times a day like in between where I'm having like brown rice and quinoa so it's just you know once again it comes down to like mastering the basics I feel like I I had an idea of what good nutrition was and I feel like everyone kind of knows um, to a certain extent, like what to do and it's pretty easy to learn. And then it's just nailing it. You know, it's being super consistent on a very simple construct. Are you allowed a cheat day? Yeah. That's something that I'm kind of learning this year is that like being too perfect, you kind of lose a little bit of your soul with food. <laughs> um, it's just too important to like have, uh, whether it's fruit or frozen yogurt or whatever, um, cake, or tacos or beer like whatever you connect with it's important to have that mm. and learning how to adapt that into your life without having it be too much or too little yeah i but once again that's pretty basic right like that's everyone kind of knows that yeah. it's just a, staying on it is the hard part i think i always say if the rock has a cheat day i can have a cheat day that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the most important thing for sure for so sure. how do you unwind tom what do you like to do when you're not thinking about swimming or studying or anything like um, that um you know i'm a pretty active person so i'll go on walks with my wife or i love to surf but i'm usually always too dead to make it over um but other than that you know like i'll watch surfing i'm a big fan of the wsl um, you know, I watch a couple of let's plays. I listen to podcasts, um, read books, you know, mm. the normal stuff with some other things. 
other than the best in the world with Richard Parr, what are your favorite podcasts? <laughs> um, you know, I recently um, found this guy. I mean, I don't know his name, but the podcast called uh, uh, Myths and Legends. Okay. So, you know, it really fits the religious studies appetite. And he kind of, he's an English major. And you can tell because he's very focused on the narrative. But what he'll do is uh, gather up all these stories and all these versions of one story and kind of compile it into a, a narrative that would fit our modern culture, I guess, and kind of make his own judgments or his own interpretation as time goes or as the story goes on. And so it's just interesting to listen to and listen to him adapt the story to um, maybe a younger audience today or, um, you know, he'll go through a Disney story and be like, well, this is how the story actually goes. And this is like why they did this and that and the other. And so it's just, you know, Hmm. it's just, you know, the sociological pondering and uh, the myth itself is just like, you know, exactly what I love about religious studies. So it kind of fits that need and I don't have to do any of the research myself. So it's <laughs> yeah. It's all, yeah. it's all straight there for you. Yeah. yeah uh, for sure. Similar for me when, when I'm trying to do some research about football, rather than going through all the articles and all the data and all the stats, I'll listen to a, yeah, yeah. a, a good podcast. You mentioned reading. Well, exactly. Cause you got your own thing going on. Mm. So you got to use the others. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's what they're there for. Um, yeah. So you mentioned books as well. What is the one book you would recommend to someone to read? Man, I ooh, Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac. Hands okay. Down. What's the, what's that about? Uh, so Jack Kerouac was, I guess, a beatnik poet. Um, but I've never read any of his poetry. But he was a novelist too. He uh, he wrote On the Road. He's kind of like in my opinion, like the quintessential 1950s and 40s, and I guess he died right before the 60s, but 60s too, like counterculture and pre-counterculture experience. Um, you know, like he was a dire Catholic, but lived by Buddhist principles and, um, you know, climbed mountains, was a hippie and into like really early to being into alternative medicine and, um, you know, being living in the Bay and uh, how much Dharma Bums is set in Berkeley and uh, North Bay and San Francisco and L.A. Um, you know, really connecting with it as like a geographical text and uh, kind of what Berkeley is about or, and was at that time. Um, I think it's an amazing read. And obviously, like I'm fascinated by um, how religions grow and how these guys and poets um kind of adapted Buddhism to their own thing and like never really went to temples and never really like learned traditions, but just kind of like read these old texts and created their own movement. Um, this is of course super interesting to kind of muse about, um, intellectually and study from a spiritual standpoint. Mm, well, that's really interesting. We'll, yeah. we'll have to check out that book. We'll have to listen yeah, to yeah. that podcast. Tom, we've nearly run out of time, but just before mm. we go, if you could just give our listeners um, some information on how they can continue to learn and follow you on Twitter, Facebook, oh, Instagram, for sure, for all sure. different social media, any websites, anything else you'd like to promote and talk about. Yeah, right? for sure. So for me, everything's really simple. Um, it, it's all BVT Shields. So I'm at BVT Shields on Instagram and Twitter. I'm Facebook.com slash BVT Shields and BVT Shields.com. So that's, uh, I know it's a, it's a, it's a funky name. It's an old Xbox gamer tag. Uh, <laughs> So that's B E E F Y and then a T shields. Um, so yeah, I mean, check it out. I got some things coming up, uh, fundraiser wise. So if you're in the California area, stay tuned for that. Um, other than that, it's just my life. Mm. You know, you're going to get lots of people wanting to play you on the Xbox. Now they'll all be searching yeah, B for yeah. T shields. So actually <laughs> that's my, my that Xbox is at my mom's house and my, my mom and dad's house. So, uh, that'll be my parents. Who, uh, <laughs> who you see on that what what are the games you play um i have a wii u um you know i'm really excited for the nx and the new zelda game i think uh wind waker uh is my favorite game so um yeah i mean link to the past link between worlds uh mario games just like the stuff that i remember from being a kid you know i played a bunch of pokemon games so i'm excited for sun and moon i guess i'm a one of those nostalgic Nintendo fanboys. I don't play much, obviously. I'm kind of busy all the time. But mm. um, when I get some time off and there's no waves, you know, I'll pick it up. 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to the new Mario game, which is going to come on the iPhone and the App Store and everything like that. I think that could be quite fun. I guess I, I should look that up, but I didn't even know. Yeah, I think it's coming in the next few months. I, I think I may have pre-downloaded it or something like that. I don't know. I, I'm, oh, not, nice. I'm not a technical person. but Awesome, awesome. <laughs> and uh, I, you mentioned before we went on the air that you, you got an iPhone 7. I, are you a tech guy? No, 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 no. I just, my contract was up and the new phone came out, and so I went and got it. Um and you know, I was I'm sponsored by Kellogg's, and um, they gave me a pair of Beats. Oh, nice! That are Bluetooth, and then since I won that Olympic gold medal, um, Beats gave me another pair. So it's like, well, I have these, and they work super well. So I just, it's kind of nice to be cordless. Um, honestly, I'm not too bummed about it quite yet. Yeah, fantastic. And how easy is it for you to be getting support? It's great that you you've got Kellogg's and, and people like that on oh, board, but yeah. is that is that something you have to kind of chase, or do they come to you? Um, you know, it's a bit of both. Kellogg's found me through LinkedIn, and then I had an agent, I have an agent actually, uh, Janie Miller at Octagon, who's awesome and amazing, and she's kind of done everything that's worked out. <laughs> and then there's things that I do on my own. Um, that I seek out like, and that'll be companies that, uh, I guess they're all really small, but that I really connect with their products. Um, so like red ace is a beet juice company and they ship worldwide. And, um, you know, and I'll post this soon too. If you follow me on Instagram, um, there's a discount code, uh, that you, uh, you go on their website and you buy beet juice, um, which is like super helpful for health and super helpful for cardiovascular health and, vasodilation and not only athletic performance but also athletic performance so thanks for letting me get that ad in there (laughs) um and you know so like i kind of did that on my own and uh, you know he's a guy he lives in costa mesa which is a town that neighbors my hometown so it's just kind of those organic um i guess it's an organic product but what i meant is like that's kind of like a a, like just a, a homegrown um kind of deal that we struck up because you know just I kept buying their product and we kept talking and I was like, well, why don't we just do this? And so it was really symbiotic. And so like stuff like that will pop up. Um, but yeah, I mean, Kellogg's and then obviously uh, my main sponsor arena, um, it gets a little bit more harrowing when like a lot of, uh, commitment is involved. And so it's nice to have representation. And, um, I think it's absolutely necessary to be honest. I'm not a lawyer, so Mm. (laughs) I will, uh, I will hire that out for sure. And I think that is uh, highly recommended if you are in this job. Yeah. And I think some of those relationships are partners and partnerships are the best ones, the ones which are ones which grow because you like the product and you use the product and you kind of, oh, you're yeah. usually helping people. Of I course. And that's fantastic. not to say that like, I think I do think that arena makes the best suit in the world, hands down. And I do think that Kellogg's makes great food. Mm. It's just that like they're multinational corporations. So it's not like it's, I've grown personal relationships out of the sponsorship, but the sponsorship didn't come about because of a personal relationship, you know? Yeah, precisely. Well, Tom, this has been a really great chat. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And we'll continue to learn from you on social media. But Tom Shields, thank you for being the best in the world. Yeah, thanks for having me on. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. Thanks a lot to Tom Shields for being on this week's Best in the World. If you like swimming, we've had swimmers on before. We've had Nathan Adrian. He is an Olympic champion. We've had him on the show. We've got former world record holder Nick Gillingham. He's been on one of the earlier episodes. Please check them out. They're all on richardparr.net, richardparr.net forward slash podcasts. Please go and check them out. They're also on the back catalog on iTunes and on Stitcher. If you've enjoyed this show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. It would be greatly appreciated. It really helps spread the word of our show. I would love it if you would do that. Any comments for the show, send me a tweet at Richard underscore par. Thanks again to our sponsors, Audible, and to Sportachino. That's facebook.com forward slash Sportachino. We've got more amazing learning from the very best sports athletes on the planet coming up next Wednesday on iTunes, on Stitcher, on richardpar.net. And it's all on the best in the world. I'll see you next week, people. Bye-bye. 
the best in the world podcast with Richard Parr.